Section 27. The world of the natural standpoint. I and my world about me. Our first outlook upon life is that of natural human beings, imaging, judging, feeling, willing, from the natural standpoint. Let us make clear to ourselves what this means in the form of simple meditations which we can best carry on in the first person. I am aware of a world spread out in space endlessly and in time becoming and become without end. I am aware of it, that means first of all, I discover it immediately, intuitively. I experience it through sight, touch, hearing, etc. in the different ways of sensory perception. Corporeal things somehow spatially distributed are, for me, simply there, in verbal or figurative sense, present, whether or not I pay them special attention by busying myself with them, considering, thinking, feeling, willing. Animal beings also, perhaps men, are immediately there for me. I look up, I see them, I hear them coming towards me, I grasp them by the hand. Speaking with them, I understand immediately what they are sensing and thinking, the feelings that stir them, what they wish or will. They too are present as realities in my field of intuition, even when I pay them no attention. But it is not necessary that they and other objects likewise should be present precisely in my field of perception. For me, real objects are there, definite, more or less familiar, agreeing with what is actually perceived without being themselves perceived or even intuitively present. I can let my attention wander from the writing table I have just seen and observed through the unseen portions of the room behind my back to the veranda, into the garden, to the children in the summer house, and so forth, to all the objects concerning which I precisely know that they are there and yonder in my immediate co-perceived surroundings, a knowledge which has nothing of conceptual thinking in it, and first changes into clear intuiting with the bestowing of attention, and even then only partially, and for the most part very imperfectly. But not even with the added reach of this intuitively clear or dark, distinct or indistinct co-present margin, which forms a continuous ring around the actual field of perception, does that world exhaust itself which in every waking moment is, in some conscious measure, present before me. It reaches, rather, in a fixed order of being into the limitless beyond. What is actually perceived, and what is more or less clearly co-present and determinate, to some extent at least, is partly pervaded, partly girt about with a dimly apprehended depth or fringe of indeterminate reality. I can pierce it with rays from the illuminating focus of attention with varying success. Determining representations, dim at first, then livelier, fetch me something out. A chain of such recollections takes shape. The circle of determinacy extends even farther, and eventually so far that the connection with the actual field of perception as the immediate environment is established. But in general the issue is a different one. An empty mist of dim indeterminacy gets studded over with intuitive possibilities or presumptions, and only the form of the world as world is foretokened. Moreover, the zone of indeterminacy is infinite. The misty horizon that can never be completely outlined remains necessarily there. As it is with the world in its ordered being as a spatial present, the aspect I have so far been considering so likewise is it with the world in respect to its ordered being in the succession of time. This world now present to me, and in every waking now, obviously so, has its temporal horizon, infinite in both directions, its known and unknown, its intimately alive and its unalive past and future. Moving freely within the movement of experience which brings what is present into my intuitional grasp, I can follow up these connections of the reality which immediately surrounds me. I can shift my standpoint in space and time, look this way and that, turn temporally forwards and backwards. I can provide for myself constantly new and more or less clear and meaningful perceptions and representations, and images also more or less clear, 
in which I make intuitable to myself whatever can possibly exist, really or supposedly, in the steadfast order of space and time. In this way, when consciously awake, I find myself at all times, and without my ever being able to change this, set in relation to a world which, through its constant changes, remains one and ever the same. It is continually present for me, and I myself am a member of it. Therefore this world is not there for me as a mere world of facts and affairs, but with the same immediacy as a world of values, a world of goods, a practical world. Without further effort on my part, I find the things before me furnished not only with the qualities that befit their positive nature, but with value characters, such as beautiful or ugly, agreeable or disagreeable, pleasant or unpleasant, and so forth. Things in their immediacy stand there as objects to be used. The table with its books, the glass to drink from, the vase, the piano, and so forth. These values and practicalities, they too belong to the constitution of the actually present objects as such, irrespective of my turning or not turning to consider them, or indeed any other objects. The same considerations apply, of course, just as well to the men and beasts in my surroundings as to mere things. They are my friends or my foes, my servants or superiors, strangers or relatives, and so forth.